All right, we're back. We have one more topic to mention. Um, this will be more important in the context of synthesis in general, more so than oxidations or treatments of alkenes. And I'm just going to present it right here because we've talked a lot about turning alkenes into alcohols. Um, sometimes we've done it via the Markovnikov additions, maybe the anti-Markovnikov additions. Uh, sometimes we use some oxidizing agents like potassium permanganate or osmium tetroxide. But in any case, you end up with alcohols at one point. Now, it may be the case that you might want to turn that alcohol into a living group. And you could do that with tosylic chloride, turn it into a tosylate, or you could actually use a new reagent. This is known as thionyl chloride which will convert your hydroxy group into a chloro group. And that's, you know, a, a fair, you know, fairly good living group. Now, the mechanism is a little bit intricate. Um, so this is something that you probably will need to have a few goes, you know, practicing wise to, to get it right. But what's going to happen right here is that thionyl chloride, which is shown here, this trigonal pyramidal structure, um, Basically, the fact that you have oxygen bound to sulfur, you have chlorines bound to sulfur, all of them being more electronegative than sulfur, make the sulfur a very electron craving site. It really wants electrons. And so when you have an alcohol, the electrons of the alcohol serve as a nucleophile that attacks the sulfur. Now, in the first event, when you attack the sulfur, you break the sulfur oxygen double bond and you form this you know, like pseudo CISO structure um, on the on the molecule. Now, because you already have living groups, good living groups, in fact, the chlorides present, what happens is that this lone pair on the oxygen comes back down to reform the sulfur oxygen double bond in the process of kicking away one of the chloro groups. And so now you have chloride, you know, lingering outside of the sphere of this organic intermediate your oxygen is still protonated. So now what happens is that you don't undergo a deprotonation. And this is the part what can actually trip you up because when you see this, you're probably very inclined to see, oh, there's a proton, let's remove that proton. But that won't actually get you anywhere, um, anywhere productive in terms of trying to turn this into a chloride. Now, instead what happens is that the chloride attacks not the proton but rather the carbon center next door because that primary center you know it's actually set up nicely for an sn2 reaction and at the same time that carbon oxygen bond those set of electrons are migrated towards the oxygen so now you end up in this case producing a, a new organic molecule um, in this case you have butyl chloride, right, or chlorobutane, whichever way you want to see it. That's actually your organic product. But then there's something else that happens with this molecule that kind of drives the process forward uh, to completion, in fact. And that is the fact that this molecule will decompose a little bit further. So now the oxygen that's been left over on the sulfur can have its electrons brought into the sulfur to create a new double bond. And then that kicks out the second chloride, which serves as a good living group uh, and not only that, it serves as a, you know, okay base to remove the proton that's present on that oxygen. And the moment this happens, you have produced one equivalent of sulfur dioxide gas and potentially hydrogen chloride gas as well. So the moment this gas, specifically SO2, is formed, unless your flask is completely sealed, the gas will exit the flask and it'll be gone. And unless it comes back into the glass, no equilibrium is going to be established. So the reaction is going to be driven by Le Chatelier's principle to the product side. And you will generate your alkyl chloride very efficiently. Now, another way to make this happen as well is to use um, a reagent like phosphorus tribromide. Instead of exchanging hydroxyl for chlorine, now we'll substituted with bromine instead. And the mechanism is somewhat similar to that of thionyl chloride. The oxygen still attacks the phosphorus with the electrons. The 
addition the uh, product that you've generated uh, then goes on to kick out the bromine and then the bromine attacks the carbon that is next to that oxygen right and that is what generates your alkyl bromide now this can actually happen two more times because you still have two more phosphorus bromine bonds that can interact here so ultimately you can form phosphorous acid which you know tautomerizes into the final form the most stable form shown here phosphorus acid uh, but in the process you're still forming an alkyl bromide and these molecules can serve as you know pretty good starting points to continue synthesis maybe you want to do an s one reaction or perhaps you want to do another elimination reaction so a common trait would be to maybe start with an alkene which is not exactly the alkene you want to deal with but you don't you don't have access to the other alkene so what you could do is undergo an oxidation an addition reaction that introduces the hydroxyl group and then you can turn the hydroxyl group into a bromine or chlorine which then you can undergo the proper elimination with the proper reagent to pretty much move that alkene to a different position so that's the kind of thing that you ought to be thinking about when it comes down to this reagent and how you can utilize it in future synthesis problems okay with that uh, we are done with this chapter now this has a lot of information so i recommend that you do rewatch some of these videos go over your notes and um, definitely practice the mechanisms but um with all with all that being said i will see you on the next lecture series bye bye